I'm excited, I'm excited to hear what you have. What you have. To... Is that Sean's background? Hey, Sean, hey. I think you might be echoing. Yeah, because um, it's always actually not a bad oh. thing when you hear an echo because you get to hear your own voice. Yeah, right. I don't like hearing my own voice when it echoes, but. Yeah, I, I, I'm always, I'm actually kind of relieved that it's not sharp. Um, you know, if it's sharp, then I'll be able to hear it in the echo. Um, but uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say, what you said in the past about like, we all have misunderstandings or they didn't get to choose that. It makes me feel less anger throughout the day. Thank you. I'm really happy to hear that. Oh, awesome. um, I do think that it's actually an accurate depiction of reality um, that um, that no, misunderstandings no, are super no, common and, yeah. you know, what cause harm, generally speaking. <clears throat> Sorry, who, 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 who is it? I got the book that's right here beside me. I'll do that. Okay. okay. Sorry, we're just doing a social social introduction. So um, for anyone that wants to okay. introduce Thank themselves um, and say sort of where you're coming in from and what interests you in tonight's topic. Yep, we'll do. Okay, thanks. I think you have um, a better we'll call. Okay. My name is Joe Bullock, um, and I am from just outside of Philadelphia, actually Haddonfield, New Jersey, exactly. Um, and tonight's topic is interesting to me because I'm uh, interested in uh, how uh, our ego actually drives our decisions um, in the sense of uh, selfishness in certain ways. Um, and is it selfish? I mean, to uh, at all. Um, and uh, what is it that what is that line between selfishness and, com and confidence? Um, there is a clear distinction between the two. And one is uh, very much related to trust in yourself. And the other one is uh, um, linked to desire. Anyway, that's cool. That's enough for me. Cool. Good to see you again. Good anyone to see else? you again. Anyone else want to give a, a quick introduction and maybe what um, where you're coming in from and uh, what interests you in the topic? Oh, Derek. Uh, I'm. Uh, I've been on these uh, discussion uh, discussions on pre the previous two meetings, as you know, Garrett. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what interests me about this one is somebody. I, I've heard this observation uh, from a few people. They made the observation that the surgeon they're talking to seems arrogant, and I've been wondering where does self confidence end and arrogance begin. Yeah, I'm going to try to answer that question with a that's bunch that's of... That's why I'm interested in this topic. Got it. I, I think it's a fascinating uh, question, and I, I think it's an often misunderstood one. So, yeah, um, yeah. so I'll try to I'll try to do my best to answer the distinction, you know, create a clear distinction or delineation between the two. Who wants and to go managing ahead? different. How do you manage different, you know, because sometimes it's real. What do you mean, um, Katie? Well, I'm using the example. I hope Derek not doesn't feel offended, but you know, like the 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 doctor that's arrogant. He might just be very competent at what he does, you know. And then he has. Right, and that's that's what that's what Derek's saying is like, how do we know? Like, wait, how do we judge whether this person is arrogant or is self confident? Which one is it? And I'm going to give a bunch of scenarios and talk about what is arrogance and what, is, you know, or I, I call it egotism, but arrogance is the same, you know, syn synonymous um, versus what self-confidence and how can you really distinguish between the two? Because I think it's super common for people to confuse the two. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to try to help help with distinguishing. I think self-confidence is a positive, healthy personal trait. On the other hand, uh, egotism is someone is unhealthy. Where a good example is say you play game, you lost. So the companies, people say, okay, I lost, I lost, I lost. I will do better next time. Egotism is different. They they will refuse. Oh, I did not lose. Okay, you will find a, whatever excuse. Okay, 
as was the difference, I, I think. So why is it healthy and when otherwise not healthy? It's a, it's a distinction. Agreed, Sean. Um, Oded, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? And uh, good to see you again, my friend. Yeah, I'm Oded Lerner. And my, my last name, I'm a learner. Uh, I live in San Jose, California. I retire uh, more than 80. What the uh, definition for me is doer and deed. Arrogant is the one that look for the doer. Self-confidence is looking for the deed, what he's doing. And this is the difference, like doer and the doing. That's about that. Thank you. Great, thanks, Oded. Anyone else want to go? I'll, uh, I'll 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 jump in there. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dathan. I'm down here in um, by Quantico, Virginia. Um, I, I study a lot about arrogance and competency, working around the military for pretty much my whole life. I, I see a lot of that. One of the things that I've done a lot of research on, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about this, this tonight eventually, is um, looking at um, Dunning and Kruger, right? The Dunning and Kruger effect, you know, looking at cognitive bias, right? Talking about how individuals who are skilled versus unaware, um, and, and some of the things that I like to bring out to my students all the time, specifically with cognitive bias, when we talk about confidence is bringing up nothing more than an, an individual with low abilities or knowledge in a particular domain. So let's just say, you know, surgeon, right? Um, they tend to overestimate their competence or skills in that domain. Um, so in, in layman's terms, in simplest terms, is people who are not very good at something often believe they're much better than they actually are. But that's not the most exciting part or the most scary part. The scary part is, their self-inflated confidence is usually matched by the people who actually are skilled, but who have low confidence. So if, if they were inverse, you would find that these people have a lot of confidence, probably not a lot of skill, but if you switch it around, um, the people who probably don't have much, have, have a lot of self-doubt, they're probably pretty good at what they do. Um, so anyway, Dunning and Kruger is something that I study a lot and I'm really fascinated to, to explore that tonight. Thank you. Can I just make a comment to what Nathan said? Sure, if you want. It seems to me what he's studying has implications for military leadership. How do you raise the low confidence people up? Hundred percent. I've been <laughs> I yeah, and that's I didn't I didn't really get into Dunning and Kruger until about four or five years ago when I when I had um one of my chairs for my dissertation kind of direct me to that way. But it's very difficult in the military to discuss Dunning and Kruger. It's similar to hubris. Um because as Thomas Jefferson said, the tree of liberty needs to be refreshed from time to time, right? Um, so we have a lot of dead leaves at the top that don't want to fall off. So it's, it's very difficult to talk about Dunning and Kruger. So yeah, not very easy. By the way, I'm making a couple of people uh, regulars, co-hosts, just in case. Um, well, is that you? Hello, everyone. My name is Rand Barton. I'm so cool. You already know. That just in case you know so <laughs> um i you know i i guess i have less patience tonight than usual um normally i give them a little bit of a warning but that was a little bit obnoxious so um so um i should have reported him why didn't i report him but um so i'm just used to removing people that don't need to be reported um so um, I made a couple of people um, co-hosts just in case we get trolls and you can help me uh, weed out the trolls or mute people if they don't mean to be muted or if they don't mean to be unmuted. Um, DLJ, you have your hand up. You want to give an intro? Good to see you. Hi, good to see you too. Uh, DLJ, student in the UK. Uh, I'm not, I'm lacking in self-confidence because I'm not sure I believe in the concept of self. Confidence is all right. Um, and I am an expert in Dunning-Kruger. I have all the exams you can test me. I am the number one knowledgeable person in Dunning-Kruger. <laughs> and has a good sense of humor, too. Thank you. Uh, uh, the example of self-confidence. Um, 
Citrine, you're not on mute and have some background noise, so I'm going to mute you. Um, anyone else want to uh, give a quick intro and um, say what interests you in tonight's topic and maybe where you're calling in from? See, they're all such a bunch of egoists. They're all shouting to first to say, me, 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 aren't they? Right, exactly. Oh, has everybody gone shy? <laughs> no, I, I, I've got a really bad cough, so I don't, uh, I, I, I can't talk very much. Uh, so I, No uh, problem. Yeah, I may not be able to stay. I, I've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow. So uh, oh, anyway. Boy. Hope you uh, feel better soon. Yeah, so do I. I. I got a big project to do tomorrow too. So for work. <laughs> oh boy. Hello, Alan. Oh, hi. How are you? <laughs> Fine. Okay. Yeah, this interests me because I I I I come across that this type of stuff all the time at work. Like some people are very smart. They're good. Uh, uh, they're good at programming. They know everything uh, business side as well. And uh, uh, it's, it's hard to distinguish between uh, uh, whether they're egotistic. Some people say they're egotistic, but then they're also very good. So uh, and and. Uh, it, Sometimes they'll work with you. Sometimes they won't. But that's that's just the way it is. So uh, I guess it's based on how uh, the circumstances. So uh, I think uh, oh. all of those things are circumstance related. Anyone else want to do a quick intro? All right, then um, maybe we'll get started. Let me um, just uh, give me one second to pull up my notes. All right, so um, tonight, um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Garrett Lang. I'm a software developer turned software inventor. Most of my career, I've been a software inventor. Now I'm an entrepreneur in the food tech space. My company's called Plate Rate. We rate individual menu items at restaurants. My hobby is writing and discussing practical philosophy. And I'm also the executive director of the Free Thinker Institute, which is the organization that brings you tonight's event. Um, I'm going to share a link in the chat for anyone that doesn't know about the FTI so that you can learn more about it if you're interested. And um, I will uh, sort of give a quick overview of the FTI. We're a not-for-profit looking to support and empower members. We really want to help people be the best version of themselves to seek truth and to be fair through transformational personal and professional development. We have free events like this one every Tuesday evening open to everybody. Uh, we cover a wide range of topics not typically covered in academia or industry. I don't think anyone has seen this necessarily, this topic covered in academia or industry widely. Um, and most of ours have not been. And we have weekly members only events where we apply practical philosophy into our lives. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're interested in that, there's a little more information about membership in the link that I shared. Um, and we would uh, love to uh, see if you might be a fit for the organization. There's no fee to be a member at this point. Um, we have only one rule in the FTI, and it is strictly enforced, and that is to be polite. So I will ask everyone to be polite tonight. You can share even unsavory opinions in the FTI. We do want free thinking, but we want polite free thinking um, because people will be more receptive to you if you can say what you want to say politely. Um, and um, uh, and so 
you know, that, uh, and, and generally when someone says something that you strongly disagree with, I recommend what we call listening to understand. And we're going to try a slightly different way of, um, having, uh, immediate responses tonight, which I'll go into, um, maybe Michael, I'll give that intro, um, after, um, I do the presentation because I'm going to try something a little different tonight and see if it works better than what we did last time. Um, but you're welcome to, if I miss anything, uh, fill in the gaps, uh, speaking okay. of, did I miss anything before for the intro? Is there any, what else did you? <clears throat> no, it's everything I expected to hear. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. and also like we, we take, uh, questions at the end of the presentation, um, based on, you know, opinions of past members, they didn't like questions along the way so that the presentation could be sort of absorbed, um, and thought through, uh, initially. And so, um, you know, just take a take a note down for any questions you have, and then there will be plenty of time for questions um, at the end. I don't think my presentation will go very far, like take very long. Um, it's pretty straightforward, um, even though I think it's a fairly complicated topic. Um, I tried to make it as cut and dry as I could, and I felt like it was easier after I did that after I wrote this essay on this topic um, than I thought it was when I was initially sitting down to write it. So. Um, and, uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen now and let me get you guys in front of me. And I have three monitors, so I might be looking around in different directions. That's because I have three monitors. And so I look in different, different directions. So, um, <clears throat> I guess you can see my screen, right? On egotism versus self-confidence. Okay, great. So. Um, I didn't get the time to update the agenda, but I'm going to start with definitions. So egotism is excessive or objection objectionable reference to oneself in conversation uh, or writing. We're more going to talk about boastfulness, um, self-centeredness, um, and selfishness um, and conceit as the, the main definitions of egotism. I found that interesting when I looked at the definition of self-confidence. One of the definition was um, excessive or inflated confidence in one's own judgment or ability. That is not the definition I'm going to be using tonight. I'm going to be using the definition of a realistic confidence in one's own judgment, ability, power, et cetera. So we're going to be using that definition tonight, just to be clear. I think that's the one used in common parlance. So I don't think that'll be a surprise to anyone. But just if there was any lack of clarity, now there's clear clarity. So. Um, why is distinguishing between egotists and self-confident people important? Well, self-confident people, as we just realized, have a realistic assessment of their capabilities. So you can trust that what they say they can do, they can do. And um, what they say they're they have a certain when they say they have a certain level of confidence, you can believe they have that level of confidence because they have a realistic assessment of their capabilities. Um, so you can basically trust them, you know, in summary. Egotists, on the other hand, have a hyperinflated self-confidence. And someone mentioned Dunning-Kruger, which is like one case of egotism where someone's intelligence level is so low, they don't realize that they don't have the capabilities that they think they have. And um, it is a real thing. Uh, although I think people scream Dunning-Kruger probably more often than is apt, but it definitely is a real thing. And um, uh, it, it, uh, I'll just leave it at that. But we're not going to get into Dunning-Kruger specifically tonight, um, although we can talk about it in the conversation portion of the evening. But basically, egotists, because they overestimate their capabilities, they're not trustworthy or reliable. And um, egotists act very self-confident. You know, they they say they can do it, right? And they, they probably think they can do it in most of those cases. Um, but even if they don't think they can do it, they're giving the sense that they can do it to another person. And so it is super easy to confuse egotists from uh, self-confident people, but I'm going to try to give tips and tricks for um, watching behaviors of people and saying in these particular situations, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through a series of situations, and then I'm going to talk about how an egotist um, responds in that situation versus how a self-confident person, self person responds in that situation. And basically, it's really important to be able to know the difference because if you mistake the two, you're giving your confidence to the wrong person. And you may be giving too much confidence to someone not capable of handling it, or you may be giving not enough confidence to someone who was capable of handling it. But either one of those is a big mistake. 
And as people mentioned in the social, <clears throat> it's very easy to confuse these two and super common. So let's see if we can help improve that tonight. Um, I'm going to give a bunch of situations, but I'm going to ask you all to think of um, situations that I didn't come up with that um, you guys would want to distinguish between um, what a self-confident person would do versus what an egotist would do. So if you have in your head, like, if I'm in this situation, how would I know if, you know, this person, or if I see this person acting, like if I'm in a particular situation, how would I distinguish between the egotist and the self-confident person? Feel free to jot down in your notes right now, whichever ones you would want me to cover. And then if I don't cover them in the six or seven scenarios that I have here, then we'll try to cover them in real time um, when you raise your hand after uh, the presentation. So first is on being right and wrong. Um, the egotist, even when it's clear they're wrong, will not acknowledge they're wrong. And so if you see someone who's doubling down on wrong and you're like, but that seems like they're wrong, but they're just doubling down and saying, no, I'm absolutely right. Even when it seems really obviously clear that they're wrong, that person is an egotist. Um, Self-confident people are actually right very often. They can acknowledge that. But if you point out that they're wrong, we'll, we'll just say, yeah, I'm wrong. And I like to say um, in the FTI, when you admit you're wrong with good judgment, you're immediately right again. You're just more right than you were before. So there's no harm in admitting you're wrong. It's actually a sign of a self-confident person when they can easily admit when they're wrong. That does take training, by the way. Like it, like, like it took me years to like just get used to like very quickly being able to say, oh, well, that's someone has logically proven I'm wrong and to let go of the egotism of wanting to be right. But if you actively, you know, would rather be more right than being right about your current belief, you'll gradually find it becomes easier and easier as you practice that skill. And I would argue all the things we talk about in the FTI are like muscles, they're mental muscles that you can exercise. And that's really what the FTI membership is about, is exercising those mental muscles and practicing applying good philosophy into our daily lives to be happier people and to help those around us be happier. Second one is on listening to others. Egotists don't let others voice their opinions in a safe and comfortable way. They want their opinion to be the one that's heard and acknowledged. And so I like to, uh, you know, I, I actually teach a product management boot camp, and what I describe is two different decision making styles. There's the egotism decision making style where the highest paid person in the room comes into the room and goes, "We don't have time to discuss this, so I'm going to make the decision, and this is what it is, and you're all going to like it." And what they don't say, but they mean, is that anyone who disagrees with them is an insurrectionist and is going to get in a lot of trouble. I think we've all worked with people like that. Um, those are the egotists. Those are not self-confident people. The self-confident person will let everyone voice their opinions and perspectives and listen to them with an open mind and make sure that everybody's voice is heard, acknowledged, and considers uh, considered in the decision-making process for important decisions. So you'll see, um, I like to think of myself as a self-confident person. So you'll see, I'll present this presentation, but then I'll look for feedback and criticism about how it could be better and what flaws do you find in it? And if people find flaws in it, I'm going to go back and edit the slides and I'm going to change them and I'm going to add scenarios and I'm looking for scenarios that I didn't think of and I'm actively asking people to think about all that. And I'm going to make sure that when people raise their hands, I'm going to make sure that people feel acknowledged and heard. And that's what we do every every week in the FTI. So this is for the regulars. You guys are used to me doing this stuff, but I'm just kind of pointing out um, the differences. So on achieving goals. Egotism is when you put yourself and your goals significantly ahead of people that you can influence. The egotist feels that their goals are the most important goals. The self-confident person is looking for achieving goals together, where you can achieve goals together and have you know a win-win scenario. That's a sign for me of self-confidence rather than someone that's putting their own goals first and um, basically ignoring other people's desires and wishes. <clears throat> Next is acknowledging strengths and weaknesses. And this is sort of, you know, probably tautological, but I didn't read the definitions of self-confidence and egotism uh, before I wrote this, but basically egotistical people overestimate their strengths and try to hide or ignore their weaknesses. And so if you see someone's weaknesses pointed out and they don't openly acknowledge them and say, yeah, you know, like someone saw one of my drawings and said, Gary, you're a pretty bad artist. I'd be like, yeah, I'm a terrible artist. Like, please don't ask me to draw anything ever again. 
Um, and you know, there are things that I'm good at and things that I'm horrible at, and I have no problem admitting what I'm good at and what I'm bad at. But self-confidence is when you acknowledge what you're good at and what you're bad at. And if you look at a chance of uh, things that could like create a chance of failure, trying to prevent those possible uh, situations that would create failure from coming up. And so a self-confident person can say, well, you know, I'm not good at art, right? So for me, um, if I need something drawn, I'm going to go to my UX person. I'm going to say, hey, Nick, can you draw this because, or, you know, come up with a design for this because I'm not good at that. And so self-confident people will surround themselves with people who complement their weaknesses um, openly rather than, um, you know, trying to hide them. Um, and self-confident people, you'll notice, can accurately predict their chances of success more often than overly confident people. If you um, are, and, and this is why time is so important in relationships and you want to trust slowly and over time and gradually trust more as you see good reasons to trust people. And what I'm trying to do with these um, scenarios is to come up with things you can observe about people as you get to know them better and see like, are they falling into the self-confident camp or the egotist camp? And, um, you know, when people accurately communicate their capabilities and how likely they are to be successful, that's a good sign of self-confidence. So in the business realm or even anything in um, in sort of work from a work perspective, um, self-confident people can advocate for themselves to take on additional responsibility with realistic estimates of what they're capable of doing. Um, they can get outside of their comfort zone and stay in the growth zone, but not in the danger zone. And I, if, um, I guess I'll just give a quick summary of what I mean by that. The, the comfort zone is where you're doing things that are easy for you, right? You're not learning and growing in the comfort zone. The danger zone is where you're so far outside your comfort zone that you're absolutely petrified and you're not learning anything and you're not capable of doing those things. That's really scary. In between those two is what, what I call the growth zone, where you're uncomfortable and you're learning and growing. You're capable of doing those things. The things further out in your growth zone, you're going to be less capable of. Um, but the self-confident person recognizes that these three zones exist and keeps themselves in the growth zone. And as you stay in your growth zone, your comfort zone gets bigger and your growth zone gets bigger. And things that used to be in your danger zone suddenly are in your growth zone. And things that used to be in your growth zone are suddenly in your um, comfort zone and you increase your sphere of influence. Now, um, self-confident people keep themselves in that growth zone if they want to grow and develop, which is what I would encourage everyone to do. I think we're on this earth to grow and develop and learn. Um, so I think staying in the growth zone is what you want to do. And if you're in a job that keeps you in your comfort zone all the time, you know, ask to be in your growth zone. And if you don't get there, then go to another place that will keep you in your growth zone, because that's what's best for our overall sort of nourishment of the soul, in my opinion. Um, egotistical people will overestimate their capabilities. They'll jump right into the danger zone without realizing it. They'll fall all over the place and then they'll start to blame other people for when they fail. Um, and that's probably another one that I don't think I included in this, but I need to. Let me, there's, I found a flaw in my own presentation while I was giving it. So, um, So um, I'll, I'll cover that one last um, because I, I thought of it. So self-promotion, um, self-confident people advocate for themselves. Sorry, was there someone that was talking? Um, self-confident people can advocate for themselves to get compensation and responsibilities that are in line with their actual capabilities, like knowing your worth. Um, you can benchmark your compensation and responsibilities with peers doing similar roles at peer companies. One of the things that I really like that New York City did is that they told employers that they're not allowed to ask people how much money they made in their last role. That really makes for a much more um, fairly compensated um, workforce because you have to judge what someone is worth in the interview process and then make them a reasonable offer, not make them the lowest offer that you can. That's an increase from their past role, which is what people typically used to do. Now, egotistical people will ask for really high compensation way beyond what they really deserve or are capable of um, and you know come up with compensation demands without benchmarking what someone similar to them or with their capabilities would normally make in the industry and as a an employer you have to judge which which of these two things is happening when you're in salary negotiations with someone um 
And then on taking credit, the egotist always wants to be the star of the show, often takes credit for other people's idea or work. Um, the self-confident person will accurate, accurately acknowledge everyone's contributions, including their own, but focus most of the communication on pointing out where others did a good job. I am not a fan of um, false humility. I think it's fine to be a self-confident person that advocates for your own strengths, but a self-confident person will equally at least advocate for other people's capabilities. Um, I think um, like I'm, I, I don't think I don't think someone in order to be self-confidence should not be pointing out their own strengths. I think it should be okay to point out your own strengths. And a lot of times people look at someone who points out their own strengths as being egotistical. And I don't think that's a, an accurate way of judging whether or not someone's egotistical. I think it's okay to acknowledge your own strengths. The question is, when someone says that that's their strength, is that really their strength? And do you see in their past behavior that that really is a strength of theirs? Um, and so um, that said, I want to point out one other is who's to blame, right? And I sort of alluded to that briefly. Um, the egotist will blame everyone but themselves. Um, a self-confident person will, um, if they're the leader in an, an effort, will first blame themselves in some regard for being the leader and failing to mitigate the risk of whatever happened wrong. But then they'll accurately hone in on the root cause of what went wrong without blaming anyone or making anyone feel bad or guilty. And this is a part of psychological safety that uh, Simon Sinek is a, you know, a very famous motivational speaker talks about. And it's dead on that you need to make people feel safe. And when you look at what went wrong, the self-confident person can point out who did what wrong in a way that doesn't put them on the spot or blame them or make them feel bad for their mistakes. They look at it more as a learning opportunity. And that's really what I think more leaders should be doing is saying, well, this is where things didn't work out. This is what we can learn from that. And this is how we can do better together next time. Right. And that's what it's about. It's not about, well, this was all Joe's fault and not at all my fault. And, you know, Joe's really the guy to blame. Right. And trying to make a fall guy, which is what a lot of corporate leaders do. They, you know, there are people like I, I had someone that was interviewing, I won't say who it was, one of my personal friends that um, that I know quite well. And he was like, Garrett, they, you know, they were interviewing, I think they were interviewing him for a role. And he recognized that the person interviewing for that role was basically being set up to be the fall guy of the organization. And, um, and so like, they were someone that had to sign that, you know, they give, um, I, I forget the exact scenario, but essentially, um, you know, like politically, um, you know, egotism based leaders like to find fall people and like blame them for when things don't go right. And so he realized that this role was like the fall guy for if leadership screwed up, this was the person that would get all the blame because they had to do the sign off on everything without really the decision making power on everything. And so, um, you know, that's a clear sign that someone is setting you up for failure, that you're responsible for everything, but you don't have the decision making power for everything. That's a that's a big red flag. Um, so that said, um, that is the end of the presentation. That's one of my shorter ones, less than 20 minutes. Um, I would love to know whether this was helpful. And so, you know, um, feel free to um, uh, write that in the chat. And I'd also love to know if there are other areas where you'd like to distinguish between what looks like egotism versus what looks like self-confidence. And we can try to do that together. I'll take a shot at it and then other people can jump in. And then I'd also love to hear from people how they will apply this in their daily life and whether or not you feel like you can better distinguish between egotists and self-confident people um, from this very short presentation. Um, and that said, as we go into the Q&A portion and conversation portion of the evening, um, you can raise your hand with, uh, I'm going to end the presentation. And at the bottom of the screen, there's a little thing called reactions. And you can do raise hand like I'm doing now. And we'll take hands in the order that they're raised. And then um, if you want to respond to what someone who just raised their hand said with asking them a clarifying question, what we call listening to understand in the FTI, where you go, well, I just don't understand where this person is coming from. And I have this great question to ask them. And, you know, feel free to just speak out. Um, like after, like, there's a space in uh, in the conversation 
um, between me and them. Um, and I'll try to make sure everybody here feels heard and acknowledged and interact with the person who answers. But if you want to jump in, feel free to jump in. And um, and uh, I'm going to try uh, to do it sort of Wild West fashion. We used to try to do the um, the little reactions thing with this party hat for people that wanted to do that. But I wasn't noticing everyone's party hat because we have more than one screen of people here. And so I don't think that's going to work because people felt ignored when I didn't actually see their party hat because they were on the other screen. And so um, I had someone even like leave the meetup just really upset at me because um, I didn't call on them, but I didn't, you know, they were on the other screen. So so I'd rather people just speak up. Um, if someone is an introvert and doesn't want to speak up but wants to speak, I'm going to ask you to write um, a direct message to um Michael Strasberg, who's my um, co-moderator, and um, he will speak up for you and introduce you, and he'll uh, he'll find a way to speak in. Is that okay, Michael? That's good. Also, I wanted to just say, when you speak, please limit your com your comments to one topic, not multiple topics, one after another. And since there are so many people, we're going to try to limit each person's contribution to three minutes. You can bring up as many topics as you want, but only one at each time you speak. Thank you for that, Michael. I forgot about that part. And um, that's why I need your help so much. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so that said, I'm going to let DLJ go next. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, actually, I score very highly on introvert. People are often surprised by that, but I'm like 98% introvert. <laughs> um, not because I'm shy, uh, simply because I prefer solitude. Right? Um, I've just spotted Katie's comment in the chat saying self-confidence is uh, the able to be insulted without being fussy. Katie, try being stranded in Australia, being a Brit stranded in Australia. <laughs> you just get used to being insulted. It's just, yeah. Anyway, my point, <laughs> evolution. There must be some sort of ad adv evolutionary advantage or survival advantage to being either or both, right? Conf well, I mean, alpha male or... Uh, although alpha males can get overthrown, um, but egotism, why Why would that be? So I put it in the chat, attractiveness. So I, I'm intrigued by the the, the ability to bond um, that, uh, well, self-confidence is, I think, an easy one. I, I, I Maybe not everybody finds it attractive, but I guess most do. But egotism, uh, well, there are egotists who have followings. But it's going. It's a different kind of thing, right? The attractiveness to an egotist is not the same as your. And I haven't got the words to explain what that difference is. So uh, discuss. That's my question. There's what's this, what's the evolutionary advantage of it, which is why it survived. There must be something. What? So so I'm going to take a stab at that, and then I would love for other people to take a stab at it as well. For me, I think egotism survives by being um like by masking itself as self-confidence the egotist seems very self-confident and we even acknowledged in the social how egotists are often confused for self-confident people very regularly because i think people don't always pay as much attention to the things that i talked about and look for the behaviors that i talked about and so the self-confident person you know the egotist can often appear to be a self-confident person and in doing so they get more money more power more responsibility and then they often learn to use politics to further sort of uh encapsulate and there's a series of uh you know if you've never read the 48 laws of power it's a very insightful uh set of uh laws uh along the lines of the modern machiavelli is the prince um which are basically unethical ways to get and uh, obtain power although i would argue half of the 48 laws of power is ethical and half of it is unethical both are worth reading just to know what other people are doing but i only encourage people to follow the ethical part so that's my hypothesis dlj i don't know if anyone else wants to chime in can i chime in about go ahead no, I mean, I think that that's actually uh, a very good distinction is the Machiavellianism, because I was thinking even along lines of dark triad type of personality. Um, and I think that that's where you're looking at the distinction between egotism. And I think that there uh, is an a unfortunate advantage sometimes to kind of 
being successful with that type of uh, approach. Um, you know, it was meant to as survival. So I, I think that that's um, it's an unfortunate reason as to as to why it's uh, people you know are able to survive or continue. But um, yeah, anyway, that's all. I'll leave it there. Great. Anyone else want to? I agree with you um, that it's unfortunate. Um, anyone else want to give an opinion on that? I thought DLJ had a really good question there. He always. Yeah, well, <laughs> that I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, flatter <laughs> him with with by that he the, he is a often a self confident guy even though he, he says he's an introvert he does come across as very extroverted. So go ahead. Sorry, you were talking. Yeah. So uh, I think there could be at least you know two potential models, and it seems like uh, Gary, you're probably kind of referencing one of them, which is that egotism and self confidence are somewhat uh, separate attributes, right? And uh, there, there's not as much overlap. I could also see another model, I'm not really, I'm pretty agnostic on which one because I don't have enough info, which is that uh, egotism without other qualities such as humility or other self-awareness, empathy, blah, 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 you know, becomes, or, or okay, let, uh, I, I phrased that wrong. Self-confidence without all those other necessary qualities becomes just egotism. So it could be something additive, whereas the difference between egotist, the self-confidence of egotist and the self-confidence of a non-egotist may actually be somewhat similar. It's just that the non-egotist has other qualities that makes them more empathetic. And I can see that also being a, quite a uh, reasonable model. So... So I'm curious to understand that better because I guess we said egotism is an unrealistic um, assessment of one's skills and self-confidence is a realistic assessment of one's skills to summarize the definitions, you know, at a high level. Yep. Yep. So I guess it sounds like what you're saying is in contradiction to that. Are you using different definitions yep. or... I'm looking at the underlying mechanism. So someone is responding to LJ because he is, if we use that definition, I, I can see the validity to that definition, but at the same time, it would not necessarily map, let's say one-to-one -to, -one to whatever genetic factors there is, if that, which is what LJ seems to be getting at was the underlying factor uh, from an evolutionary standpoint. So I can see the possibility where uh, it's actually, you know, not categorically different, but only that the difference between like uh, egotists and non-egotists is that they uh, confident egotists and confident non-egotists is that they both have self-confidence, but then the egotist lacks, lacks other qualities or maybe the self-confidence too extreme that it manifests in a way that, uh, you know, appears that way. Uh, I'm trying to, there, I'm sure there are other examples, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that there, there might be other examples of cognition maybe even in terms of uh, like uh, certain like mental illnesses or whatever, you know, or, or let's say take, uh, take, you know, the, the difference between genius versus, you know, somewhat kind of Asperger, like on the spectrum, right? There's, it's not that one's genius, one's the other, it's just that if the qualities are too extreme, then it, it manifests in a certain way that we consider negative. Does that kind of make sense? Does... That makes sense. Um, I'm also wondering if maybe it's not so much genetic, but if egotism is a product of um, a maladaptive development. I, I've known egotists who were raised in dysfunctional homes where they were not, there were not allowed to develop sense of independence, self-confidence, self-agency, and they overcompensated by becoming um, egotistical, inflating their own abilities because they could not confront what they felt they were, which is really weren't who they were. They had never really blossomed into the person they were supposed to be in the first place but as a way of compensating for their sense of inadequacy. And I wonder if that's equally or perhaps more important than the genetic component. 
And I ask that um, seriously because I really do not know. All right. I think that's a really interesting take, Michael. And I think you you have a great point there. I'm going to move on to the next hand in just a second. But um, I think, you know, there's... Hands keep dropping. <laughs> What's that? Hands. I had my hand drop up there. I was going to be next and then it got dropped. I don't know. Oh. I had to put it up again. So that, were you, yeah, we were you before there. Joe? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, then we'll we'll let you go back in the order. Just so people know, when your hand is up, if you speak locally, it will give you a warning that says you're. It looks like you just spoke. We're going to drop your hand. So just pay attention for that warning. And if you say okay. no, I'm not going to drop my hand, then um, it'll it'll keep your hand up, but it'll warn you before it drops your hand for you. Um, so, um, but I I do think um, you know, Michael, that's a really good point, psychoanalyzing like why people become egotists, which I didn't get into. I didn't have enough time to prep for tonight to get into the um, why do people become egotists, um, where I probably would have tried to go into that. I think that would be a good a good topic to continue a thread on uh, conversation wise is what creates egotism and egotists um, so that we can you know raise our kids to not be egotists, right? And I think that's really an important topic um, as a father of two children. Um, so that said, I want to let uh, Derek go. And I, I have to step away for one minute and I'm going to let Michael moderate. I'll be back in two minutes. Okay. That's good. Because I was going to kind of build on what Michael just said. Everybody's born with a certain set of personality traits and circumstances can bring out the best or the worst in them. Some people in very bad situations, it brings out the best and some it brings out the worst and history is full of such examples um and even if you Vic, read victor frankel's book uh from his experience in concentration camps it's specifically about some of that some people rose above their circumstances and some people did not I mean, there's a lot of these examples so i'm thinking about the in when you're dealing with in Large, large organizations or larger social situations, people might exhibit one set of certain personality character, characteristics you would, might not observe if you're dealing with them one on one because of that particular social environment they were in, positive or negative. And I think this goes to some of the some organizations if the organizational culture has a almost a Darwinian approach, survival of the fittest uh, characteristic to it, It's you're going to observe certain dominant characteristics of the so-called leaders in the organization, whereas if it had a more participative management style, you might observe different characteristics, even with the same people. However, the latter might choose different people to lead it eventually. But uh, So it's not just, it's... I think social psychology is complicated. Personalities are complicated. <laughs> so I don't, I don't see it as strictly being egotism versus self-confidence. Uh, one or the other being dominant in a particular person. I think things can vary from time, circumstance to circumstance. I agree with you, Derek. And it, it can be um, it can be even a specific skill that someone might be self-confident in one skill but egotist egotist about another skill i don't think it's like a you know if someone is wholesale egotist versus self-confidence um you know someone may have an accurate assessment of some things and not others so yeah that's why i've noticed in some court some organizations i i my a lot of my background is in organizational behavior some organizations you get ceos hiring people that think like they do some yeah. will, some will hi deliberately hire people that don't think like they do. Yep. But they know they can work with them. Yep. No, that's a great point. And that that's part of where I would call the ones that hire the, the diverse set of people to be generally the more self-confident ones because they want that diversity of thought rather than just people who think like them. Like, I'll give an example of my former employer back when I worked for GE they were best managed company of the world almost every year I worked there. And then they hired Jeff Immelt, who, you know, surrounded himself with yes men who would agree with him 
And he made a lot of really bad decisions that I was saying, this guy's going to ruin this company. And everyone's like, who are you to question the CEO of GE? And I'm like, look, I hope I'm wrong, but I think he's going to ruin the company. And he ended up getting GE delisted from the Dow. It was one of the original members of the Dow Jones uh, Industrial Average when it was created, like the only one remaining from its original creation. And here it is like a shadow of its former self because he didn't surround himself with people who would challenge him and think complimentary thoughts and ideas and bring new ideas to the table and tell him where his blind spots were. Yeah, so, nothing like groupthink to kill an organization. Exactly. And, you know, there's a big difference between groupthink and collaboration, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. you know, groupthink of having the leader be the one thinking and everyone else agreeing with them, that's not healthy. Collaboration, I think, is very and consensus driven leadership, I think, is very healthy. So um, I like to distinguish there for the people that are Ayn Rand fans tend to be. <laughs> and I used to like her in college uh, a lot. And I still agree with half of what she said, but I disagree with the other half. So <laughs> and it, yeah, but that's another topic for another night. We should we should maybe do one on Ayn Rand some night. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you, Derek, for your comments. I don't know if anyone had anything that they wanted to respond to Derek on. All right. Um, so Go ahead. If, uh, yeah. Only because my my background is in psychology and um, the only uh, personality system that's actually scientifically studied is the big five uh, personality. Yeah. Uh, and as far as I know, uh, the there are two out of the five that are actually mostly genetic. I mean, we're talking about 70, 60 to 70 percent, which is openness and extroversion. So extroversion, introversion uh, tends to be mostly genetic and openness to ideas uh, as opposed to being closed-minded. Um, yeah. And so I will, um, I don't know if I want to go all the way back to the end to say so something else I wanted to say now. <laughs> you, you shouldn't have had to. You you should have yeah, not. Yeah, like... no. As I was talking, I missed the cancel thing. Uh, it's okay. Saw... It's okay. We'll we'll put you back where you were. Who you who were you uh, after? I was right after Dathan. Okay, so we'll get you back there after Dathan. Don't worry. Okay, I appreciate that, Gary. Thanks. Yeah, of course. And and Carl, if you're open to it, I'd love to collaborate with you. I'll I'll put my email in the chat. I would love to collaborate with you on a Big Five event. Um, I'd like to do one on the Myers Briggs, and I'd like to do another one on the Big Five. I don't know enough about the Big Five, and I want to learn more about it. And so I would love to learn from you about how it can be applied in practice, et cetera. So, um, sure. yeah. So if you're open to that, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, that said, uh, Joe, uh, did did you uh, you had your hand up now? Uh, Seanick, I think are are you doing the party hack because you want to respond to what was just said? Yeah, yeah. I just had a quick question to Carl. Uh, he just mentioned, and I didn't know this, that uh, openness was extremely uh, genetically uh, defined. Uh, yeah. and like the ones uh, but you know it it bring, it's a bit surprising to me and i don't know if you have any theory about why it might be because i've seen so many people like I, I've, basic observation tells me that you know there's some kids are or some people are so open minded uh, you look at history or and then uh, you see their family they're extremely close minded yeah. it might be the case that the ones who stood out they stand out, but statistically, they're very less. Uh, yeah. But I don't know if they, I was extremely surprised about that fact. Openness yeah. is, I don't know if you have any comment on that. Um, well, the only thing I would mention, it's not it's not 100%. It's it's kind of 63% is the, the last uh, uh, data that I've heard about openness. I know the, uh, the researcher Jonathan Haidt did a whole book uh, on that, which explains the uh, the morality dynamic and the polarization, especially in politics and religion, that has to do with the Big Five. So that that was a fascinating book to read, um, because there's a lot of things that you think are just kind of preferences, but they really technically come down to the genetic part. What was, uh, the, and also, what was the book name again? Sorry, sorry? what was the book name again? Uh, like... I forget the title, but the the author right. is John, Jonathan Haid. Uh, maybe Joe knows the title. Yeah, the righteous mind. The righteous mind. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the uh, but but just to answer uh, Sunak, um, just because something is genetic does not mean it's hereditary. 
So you so that's that would explain why somebody <coughs> could put their mind, but both their parents could be uh, closed minded. So so um, just just to make that distinction. Yeah, but you know, uh, yeah, that sense. But you know, I'm I'm just saying back from observations. You know, I've seen. And I, I would say, you know, the observation is a little biased, again, for certain people who have been really, really successful, but, you know, you go through their biographies, and it seems that their background has been a little close-minded. I mean, yeah. general, you know, not, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, phobic against geriatric people, but, you know, old people, they won't like to, as, obviously, if you go become older you become more conservative you become more, a little close-minded you know from you know the yeah. experience that so it, it it's just an impression but i i also know that you know intelligence is very very you know hereditary uh, it's 60 percent or something like that and yeah. a marker for intelligence is of openness on the big five uh, so maybe that's also kind of linked. Let's let's save the big five stuff because we're going to do a whole nother event on that. So we'll save those for another night. But thank you for asking. Yeah. And uh, as long as Carl's ag agreeable to that, it sounds like he is, then we're going to we're going to do this. Um, you got so, it. Um, I was just going to suggest that the openness can be beaten out of people. It can be beaten down and suppressed. So there's nothing, no openness left, however genetically linked it might be. History shows all kinds of examples of oppressive regimes where society becomes very closed and uncommunicative. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's getting to Michael's point about like environment can really you know make make someone different than how they would naturally be if they're allowed to express themselves openly. And that's right. why I talk so much about psychological safety, because if a leader is egotistical, he shuts down his whole organization. And now the organization can't be self-confident because uh, in rule number one of the 48 laws of power is don't outshine the master. And if the boss doesn't want employees that are smarter than them, they're going to only hire, you know, the, the joke in uh, industry was A players hire A players, B players hire C and D players, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that said, I want to let Joe go. We have a lot of hands up. Um. Yeah, no, I mean, the one thing I would say just really quickly as far as confidence is concerned is that uh, I think somebody that's confident will uh, often uh, own the failures and actually um, when there are successes attribute it to who is responsible for the successes, which are usually the people around them. And I think that that's somebody that's confident enough that they don't need the glory, but they also are willing to take uh, responsibility for anything that doesn't work. Uh, so that that's a confident individual. Um, the second thing I just really quickly had to say along the same lines is that what we've been talking about this idea of openness, Ray Dalio actually covers this pretty well, um, in particular with uh, his principles book. And he talks about being a hyper realist. And this idea of being open, and not only open, but radically transparent. And that's a, that's a confident individual, because if you're transparent, that means you're willing to ex accept who you are, bear who you are to everyone else. And that is an act of confidence versus arrogance. And now that is that you get the feedback that you need. So then you can surround yourself with people that compliment you so that you know what your strengths are, you know what your weaknesses are. Someone that's actually arrogant or an egotist Ha, will not admit their shortcomings. So I think that that's, and they, he, they, they had a very stringent scoring system that actually provided that, you know, feedback um, uh, for teams, you know, the way they would work together at Bridgewater Capital. But I think that that's where you really start to say, okay, not only am I going to be open-minded to take um, people's uh, opinions, but I'm going to also let everybody know hey, I'm human and I'm going to make mistakes and this is who I am. And, you know, that takes a lot of courage to do in a business setting and it may even get you killed sometimes. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that if you really want people around you that are actually going to compliment you and actually make you successful, then being a hyper realist, which is one of his principles, is essential in that case. Um, so I think those two things, you know, the idea that 
you give credit to people when there are successes, take responsibilities when there's failures, be a hyper realist, be open minded, but be transparent. Great, agreed completely. And I don't have anything to add to that, um, but I want to get through hands. So I'm going to let Dathan go uh, next. Go ahead, Dathan. Appreciate it, everyone. I kind of want to take this conversation probably to a little direction real quick. Um, being in and around the military for 23 years, I'm going to kind of po propose this, but are military forces egotist or self-confident? Now, I say that to one, have a little discussion, but two, you know, looking at Russia and Ukraine, right? We've got a, you know, in the military, we call them near peer forces, right? We've always adapted or we've always practiced to fight Russia as a near peer. I've been practicing that for 23 years of my life. And now lately, we've been shifting our mindset to be like, wow, wait, wait, wait. I don't know if Russia is actually a near peer. I, I, I think there's something there when we're talking about ego and self-confidence. Now, I also spin the table around and I look at the U.S. I look at myself when, when I was in Iraq, right? The military wants, and I'm going to say this, but the military wants confident egotists, right? Some individuals in the military may display, display both confidence and egotism simultaneously. And that's actually a good thing. I, I know it may not be great in the civilian sector, but in the military sector, it's a great thing because you have service members who generally believe in their abilities, their equipment, their training, and they even have the skills to, to back it up, right? However, I will also say that their excessive self-focus can be arrogant, right? In the disregard of others, um, egotistical behavior, especially when we're overseas, because we kind of go overseas as the American juggernaut, and then we get to Iraq, and then we have, for lack of better words, we've, we've got people who are less trained than us um, giving us a run for our money. So we also got to look at, you know, context-dependent behavior as well, right? And I, and I again, I go back to the military. When we look at individuals exhibit self-confidence in certain situations that we've been trained for, for forever. But but what happens? And this is one of the points I think Michael brought it up or Derek. What happens when? when their training is put to the test, right? So anyone can shoot at a target that's not moving in the States when the environment's comfortable and you know, you're know you gonna go home and eat three squares a day. But what happens when you're deployed for 13 or 14 or 15 months and you're being shot at and that target's now shooting at you? You know, how does your confidence take a hit and, and your ego takes a hit? So it's one of the things that we're looking at in the military right now, specifically in the Marine Corps, is how do we balance the two? But we're also trying to balance the two to the civilian sector because we, we understand that we're a microcosm of society. So we're getting a lot of civilians in there whose values, morals, or beliefs may not align to what the Marine Corps needs you to do. So it's interesting. And I know, I know it's funny because I talked to a lot of people about the military and, and they kind of shirk at me a little bit because you can't say anything bad, bad about the military. But having served in it for so long and still serving in it, I can say that we do have an ego problem and we do have a little bit of overconfidence. Um, and I, I would argue that Russia, you can go talk to any Russian soldier and I think they would say the same thing because they're kind of in the same boat. So just, just something to think about. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that a lot of people may not look at, but the military, I know everyone looks at politics. I, I know everyone looks at politics and presidents, but, you know, and I love our military, but we, you know, we're not above it. We're just not above it. Thank you, Dathan. And yeah, I, I think you're you are exactly hitting on what Derek said, which is, you know, some members of the military are self-confident in some areas and egotists in other areas. And all I would say to that is I would love to see a military where they were just self-confident rather than sometimes egotistical. And I would guess, Dathan, that you would agree that would be a better place than we are today. Oh, 100 percent. So there's a book out there by Thomas E. Rick. It's called Fiasco. I believe he wrote it in 2006. Phenomenal book. I think uh, Michael brought a point up about, um, you know, looking at reflection, right? Looking within. So it's kind of hard because you would think that with self-reflection, we would look back and say, oh, let's learn from mistakes and grow. But being very honest, the military is not redesigned that way. We don't really look at our mistakes and say we're going to grow from them. We look at our mistakes and say, well, whose fault is it? Is it the political, is politics false? Is it the left, is it the right? Is it, we're gonna blame everyone but our, ourselves. But, um, and I will say this, when you think, when you think of the terms um, military grade, I love that term, military grade. You hear it on every Ford F-150 commercial out there, military grade. <laughs> and I will tell you what, being in the military, whenever I hear the term military grade, I shudder. Because military grade doesn't, 
I don't think you know what most of it is. It's it's made by the lowest bidder. It doesn't sound as cool as you think it does. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that goes to our thinking. When people say, again, this is not a military bashing because I absolutely love the military. But when people say, you know, our military is almost above it, it's like, yeah, I don't think you understand your military is being run by a bunch of 18, 19, 20 year olds who are out there with guns and who are half the time drunk. Like, I don't think you realize that's what combat is. It's not. 30 or 40 year olds fighting. It's usually a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds. Now you got some old farts like me that are leading them in combat. But when it comes down to the, the end of the, the rifle, it's probably an 18 year old kid who's out by himself, who's probably drunk or whatever. Um, and his ego sometimes takes over where, whereas, you know, we could use a self-confidence, but it's an interesting case where we're, 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 we're approaching that right now with a lot of ethical discussions in the military. We're trying to I'm not saying solve it, but we're trying to bring that into leadership forms within the military context. It's just very hard because the military, like the rest of the country, is just fractured right now. So we're, we're, it's one stitch at a time, and this is just one of the lower rung stitches that we're trying to get to. But I, I definitely agree, Terry. Got it. So basic tra basic like training you? isn't enough to beat the beat the ego out of them. You know, girls. <laughs> and, uh, and and Derek, I, I know you mean that in jest, but I would say it's the exact opposite. Basic training yeah. instills in you such a pride. You know, people say they're they're fans about their favorite football team, right? Kansas City Chiefs, yeah. Philadelphia Eagles, whoever, your favorite football teams. Marines are fanatical just about being Marines. We are absolutely fanatical about nothing more than being a Marine. That that's it. We're not fanatical about the country and God and apple pie. We're just fanatical about the ego globe and anchor wearing our chest. So when we go to boot camp, I would say it may, it exacerbates it. It takes whatever egotism you had before you got to boot camp, which trust me, they inflate before you get there, oh, wow. and they make it ten times worse once you're in boot camp. Uh -huh. And then by the time you graduate boot camp, you're you're just you, you think you can take on the world and just go ask any Russian soldier how that's working out for him. So. It needs to be a balance, but we're still working. Still working. So, so, so David, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Um, do you, I, I know your, it seems your experience is mostly in the Marines, but do you know, like, does that vary across the different branches in the military? Do you see kind of variation in terms of uh, confidence or egotism? Yeah, does that also kind of vary between like different? So, I'm kind of curious about the different ways it could vary across the branches of the military, across the different levels within the for the military and across maybe just how long they've been in service, right? The, the overconfident 20 year old versus somebody who's been shot at for four years in Iraq. You know, do you see like any patterns there? Thank you. It's So it's a great question. It depends on your service, like you said. So the, I would just, again, being honest, the Marine Corps being the top tier, we're talking about egotists, right? Being the top tier. Um, the Air Force being the opposite, the Air Force, the way we call it, so the military is called the POA, the profession of arms, same way you have a lawyer profession, a doctor profession, we are called the profession of arms, right? The Air Force is a little bit different. The Air Force likes to say that they are a profession of arms, of course, but the Air Force takes it to a different level of professionalism. We take it to professionalism too, but our profession is very dark and it's all about destruction of the enemy, whereas the Air Force is a little bit more Socratic in, in how they execute the profession of arms. Um, and then you've got the Navy kind of in the middle and the Army kind of on the, the left spectrum with, with the Marine Corps. Um, so it, it does depend on your branch. I would say that if you got an Air Force guy and a Marine and a soldier in a room and you had them talk, you're going to figure out which one's the Marine, which one's the Air Force pretty quickly. Like, it's not going to be hard to figure out which one's the intellect. And I'm not knocking Marines because I have to think I'm an intellect and I'm a Marine, but um, we're not really into let's talk about your feelings. We just want to find out where the enemy is and, and that's all we really care about. Whereas the Air Force, they want to stop and ask questions. The Air Force want to know why they're doing what they're doing because they got multi-million dollar jets that they can't afford to lose because someone's making a, a rash decision. Um, exactly. and, sorry, and you're absolutely right. It does depend on how long you've been in the service. If you've been in for four years, your viewpoint is, I would say your ego is worse if someone's been in less time because they don't have enough time to have a little bit of hubris yet. They don't, they've never been humbled. The older you get, I've been in 23 years, the older you get, you get humbled a lot. So I've been to Iraq three times and I've been humbled every single time I've been there. Um, so my humility is pretty high, but someone that just came in last week, he probably thinks he could take on the Chinese or the Russians by himself. So time does matter as well. Thank you, Dathan. And I wanna let, uh, who is here um, after Dathan that lost their hand? Thank you, um, Carl, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Garrett. 
Um, I just had a question. Um, so we talked earlier about how um, ego egotists somehow uh, get very easily mistaken for self confidence. It's very very by the masses. Usually, we see that a lot in politics. Um, and and the name that shall not be named that starts with a T probably is a good example of that. Uh, but um, <laughs> what happens when uh when you got the opposite. So in my own personal experience, and I don't know if anybody else has has uh, experienced this, where you are self-confident, but you are mistaken for somebody who's an egotist and arrogant and without any other intent uh, or motivation behind it. Um, so I tend to be kind of an introvert, but when it comes to things that I kind of know about, I tend to be a bit mistaken by an extrovert for an extrovert, but I've had a lot of issues where I kind of find out that like people mistake me for an, uh, like an arrogant, conceited, uh, you know, with my kind of desire to teach about things that I know about. And I'm wondering if anybody else, or, or how do you deal with that? That's kind of the question for anybody who has that experience. Yeah, I can speak to that. I, I've definitely had that happen too. And um, I will say, you know, what I've tried to learn to do is to say, so why do you think that, right? Like, help me understand where you're coming from. What makes you feel like I'm egotistical? And just try to dig into like what their perspective is. And a lot of the times that comes from someone who is so used to being surrounded by egotists and doesn't have experience, more, you know, like, really knowing people who are genuinely self-confident. And so they're so used to falsely identifying someone who seems self-confident as just, oh, they seem confident, therefore they're an egotist because everyone that they've seen that seemed confident was an egotist. And so I think that that is often where it comes from, from like my attend intending to like empathize with the person and understand where they're coming from. Um, but, you know, that that's just been my experience. I do think that it happens really often. And like, and that's why I say it's so easy to confuse in both directions. There are a large number of egotistical people and some people are in communities where that's the norm. And so that's just what it's the pattern that they're used to seeing and they can't recognize self-confidence. And that's why I thought tonight's event was so important. And it was actually Mayu, uh, who was like an early member of the FTI and a volunteer that I was talking with about this topic. And I was like, we need to do an event on this because this is a real problem. Like people don't get what the difference is. And it's so important because who you put your faith in and who you put your trust in depends on recognizing if they're an egotist or a self-confident person. I have some questions for you. I yeah. just came back from job interview about two hours ago. And now we have, I have the big dilemma. If I say that I have self-confidence and I know all the technical issue, the person that interview me can think that I am just very egocentric, taking all the stuff that's been done on myself. And uh, I'm wondering, if there's no real feedback during job interview. Should you emphasize your self-confidence to get a job? Oh, you have to get less and say, oh, the company was doing very well and I have the company. And this may put you in, in maybe inferior technically, but maybe better as less egocentric. Part so, of the, so what is the optimum point? The optimum the point is to accurately describe your capabilities. And so if you know you're excellent technically, Say you're excellent technically and then let them test you and let them ask you technical questions. And if you can answer all those technical questions really well, then they're going to go, oh, this guy knows he's technically strong and he's got answers to all the questions. He's, you know, run circles around me. He, you know, he knows more than I do. I, I think we need to hire this guy, right? And that's what you want is someone that if you're smarter than them, they want to hire you. And not everyone's like that. The insecure managers, they want people that are not as smart as them. That's why we say B players hire C and D players. You know, A hire A players, hire A players. Uh, this was my main dilemma during the interview that I cannot put how good I am because I may exceed the interviewer 
level of confidence. So, so um, you know, you you do want to be careful not to outshine the master and make them feel like you'll be a threat to them. But you know, Oded, you're you know, you're like I wouldn't I wouldn't be as fearful as that of that as uh, of not showing your capabilities. Because especially if you're going for an individual contributor role, you want to show your capabilities and that you can execute. Thank you. Yeah, no yeah, problem. And I think, I think that maybe there's like tactical considerations versus strategic considerations. So by tactical, I mean, okay, just acing this interview. And uh, then in this case, you could ask them, are you a uh, manager or you're a B manager? And if they say they're an A manager, you bring your best. I'm, I'm making a joke, right? But yeah. part of that would be on the tactical level, would be kind of reading, try to get a sense of what this manager is about. But on a strategic level, it may be kind of asking yourself, are you comfortable kind of working with a like a B manager that's always going to be worried of, of you outshining him? And if that's not your long-term plans, maybe it's actually better for this to be kind of a neutral filtering out where you know, you present your best and you get selected by the eight managers. Uh, so it's actually a, a, you know, it's not a bug, it's a feature, right? The problem is I've been introduced to this person as a hiring manager. I don't always, this person is technical or management or CEO. I don't have no idea. And I have to guess what the person is build off during the interview. So it was done for real time situation when I have to figure out who is this person and he tried to find out who I am. And this kind of very interesting game is I saw it. Well there shouldn't be a game like that or that you you can ask like hey just wanted to know who you are and you know when they give you time to ask questions say you know you you won't know until after they've asked you the questions probably because you shouldn't ask before you sit down although to be honest a good company will tell you who you're interviewing with and what their title is like that is hiring manager He was the hiring manager Yeah Yeah but so usually they'll tell they you their title time. like are they the CTO or you know like they should tell you the title of the person you're interviewing with that's the title but no more than that hiring manager Who yeah I mean know? hiring manager isn't a title right like that's just I'm the guy hiring for this role but they should give you a title of CTO or VP of engineering or you know some actual objective title and you you know you can always email in advance and say hey I was just curious could I know the the names and titles of the people that I'm interviewing with and you know ask that politely and they may give it to you, they may not, but it doesn't hurt to ask that. Like it should be fair game to ask the title of the person you're interviewing with. Also, if you know their name, if you know their full name, you can look them up on LinkedIn at that company and I'm sure you'll find them. Um, okay. That's it, I wanna uh, go to Seanic. Um, okay, good Thanks, Oded. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, I don't know if this was covered earlier, uh, if it was covered, what's the difference between an egotist versus an egoist? Uh, I was doing some quick Google searches, didn't find anything satisfying, but I don't know if anybody else talked about this earlier. Uh, I behind that. Can, I uh, can I reply real quick? Because I actually had the same question, but I did look it up on, on Google and I got an answer. So yeah, I, can, I, was... I can probably share that for you, uh, Sunak. So, uh, and actually Dominic just kind of on the chat just said something that's kind of like uh, connected to that. So egotist is is somebody who's self-conceited um, and arrogant, right? Like the way Garrett mentioned in his lecture. Egoist is somebody who's selfish and doesn't care about others. They just care about themselves. If that makes sense. I, I think oh, there are okay, synonyms. Yeah. I just looked them both up in dictionary.com and they sort of seem like synonyms to me. That's what I thought too, like a while back, but I got the, I got, I don't know what no. happened. So I'm the, I'm the first one to the question. Egoist says an arrogantly, is that different? Egoist says an arrogantly conceited person, a self-centered or selfish person opposed to altruist. 
and egotist I already defined, um, but it's selfishness, self-centeredness, excessive and objectionable reference to oneself in conversation or writing, conceit, boastfulness. So, you know, those sound fairly synonym to me, you know, synonymous, the, synonymous the, to me. So, the only difference I can figure out, I, I saw the, the the definition you were talking about, Carl, is if that were true an egotist will most likely try to form himself in discussions while uh, a, an egotist would do that. But an egoist who is just selfish, if he has no need, he will not necessarily uh, try to uh, exalt himself. Right? Well, actually, I think somebody could be both. Somebody could be selfish and not care about others and also be conceited and, and think they're the best when they're not. Like actually, um, egotism uh, uses egoism as a, a self-referential definition. So the definition of egotism includes egoism in it. Mm. So they really are synonymous, like definition-wise. They refer to each other in the dictionary.com definition. So, <laughs> like, you know, that you don't get more synonymous than referring to each other in the definition. So um, right. I want to let Katie go uh, next. Yeah, I'm listening. Um, I think Carl and Odette, uh, Odette mentioned the definition of of arrogance that I usually think is where because you have yours is more about like being having accurate self awareness, and mine is more about having more of an attribute but then using it skillfully, so that people don't. Um, and I think some of that is also that maybe not everybody should be close friend. Um. You might want to, you know, like you're saying, Carl, like wanting to teach. Well, if you want to teach, then you have more ability than somebody in something. Maybe that's not similarly situated. Um, so always finding those people that are similarly situated. Yeah, arrogance um, is an offensive display of superiority or self-importance or overbearing pride. So arrogance is different than egoism and egotism, which are synonymous arrogance you can be self-confident and arrogant at the same time if you're like parading about how great you are then that can still be arrogant if you're sort of offensively parading it about in a way that makes other people uncomfortable right like that's arrogant but not necessarily an egotist or an egoist does that make sense uh katie And definition is open to criticism. All definitions are open to criticism, right? Like, and it's use of the word offensive. If the, if the recipient can define what's offensive, then I guess anybody could be arrogant. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's true. Like, you can be considered arrogant to someone and not arrogant to a group of reasonable people, right? An unreasonable person yeah. might still consider you arrogant. And by definition, they're allowed to do that because it was offensive to them. So you're right, Derek. It's a, you know, uh, but that you know that's part of the, yeah, the the double edged sword of language, right? Back to back. That was go back to my surgeon question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, the next I mean, person might not think that same behavior is arrogant. They might just yeah, think it's all confident. You know, the question that I would ask is look at the surgeon's outcomes. And I forgot to go yeah. back to your surgeon question. Look at their outcomes. Yeah. If they have like way above industry average outcomes and they're displaying a high sense of self-confidence, well, they're probably just self-confident. But if you look them up and they're in like 13 different lawsuits where, you know, they've been found guilty of negligence and they're exhibiting really high sense of self-confidence, they're an egotist, right? Yeah. Like if they got sued successfully by 13 people, and they act really self-confident, they're compensating for their lack of confidence rather than being confident, which is what a lot of egotists are doing. And I to talk about Michael's point about like, you know, nurture making egotists, if you're surrounded by a lot of very successful egotists in your life, and you see that as the way to success, you might think, well, I'm going to emulate that, right? People emulate the role models of successful people. And so if the people that you see six are successful are egotists and then you may, you know, you may emulate that. And to be honest, you may be emulating a bunch of self-confident people, but doing it before you have 
the um, actual skills to merit the self-confidence and you just don't realize what you're doing because you don't know the difference between self-confidence and egotism. You just see everyone else as self-confident. And so you start to be self-confident, but you don't have the skills to back it up that, you know, that can be true too. So there's so many different possibilities. Yeah. But what's Maybe your... just, yeah, that's, that right. could be yes, man behavior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but it can be, you know, it can be inadvertent sometimes. Like, and that's where I, you know, Katie, Katie mentioned how I talk about how there are so many misunderstandings. I would argue the egotists have a misunderstanding too. And even if they're knowingly egotists, they have a misunderstanding thinking that some of us aren't going to figure out that they're egotists and realize that, those are people we shouldn't trust and we tell other people not to trust them. So, um, so anyway, I want to let Kelly go. How are you, Kelly? Uh, okay. You know, we are talking about very complex, you know, issues, but I want to briefly touch on, you know, gender, you know, issues as well. Um, so the male has a higher in you know higher level of egotism and you know self confidence than the female i'm talking about you know generally and because you know it is an individual difference so for instance in terms of self advocacy the women we are very good at speaking for other people but we are you know a little bit less good at speaking for ourselves. Uh, so, I mean, in our you know, organization, I really experienced uh, and evidence too, but the male has a higher, you know, the index to really advocate you know, themselves. So I just, you know, it is really totally another topic, you know, we're gonna, yeah, but you know, there is a uh, clearly uh, gender difference as well. So that's an interesting point. I um I guess um you know I I put it into ChatGPT and what I what it came up with is that um narcissism is definitely studied and higher in men than women based on a psychological bulletin in 2015 um and narcissism is highly related to egotism which is why they came up with that but I don't know that egotism has been studied or if it has, ChatGPT didn't pick it up. Um, but I, I do think that um, men exhibit more self-confidence and I can give a, a studied example of that, which I, I like to say as much as I can because I think it will help people, particularly women, um, is um, they did a, a study of people applying to jobs. And I think this will agree with your point, Kelly. Um, and uh, what it turned out is that um, women, when applying to a job, felt like they needed to meet 80% of the job criteria in order to apply. And men, when surveyed about the same thing, they would apply if they met 20% of the criteria. And so, uh -huh. you know, I tell that to all the women I meet that I meet career wise, because I'm like, look, if you meet 20% of the criteria, just apply, like apply, put your hat in the ring. Like, you're uh -huh. competing against men who only meet 20%. If you meet 50%, you're like way ahead of them. So, um, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, that, that would be, you know, like the egotism, I can't necessarily like, uh, give a study for, but that I can give a study for and the narcissism I can. Seanic has his party hat up. Seanic, we're, we're not doing the party hats because I can't see them. So just speak up when you want to talk. Um, go ahead. Oh, okay. No, uh, uh, I, I agree with what Kelly said, you know, that uh, you know, the statistics are right on the narcissistic side, though I wonder if it actually means of the group of narcissists out there, I believe three quarters are uh, men, but that doesn't necessarily mean all men are predisposed to that. In any case, uh, it's also- Really, yeah. Yeah, it's also a fact that, you know, men, e even if they are not narcissistic, they will at least advocate for, let's say, higher pay, or given the chance, they will advocate for higher pay. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the men did anything wrong here, but it's that women need to stand up and ask for more when they have that opportunity. So uh, it's a small distinction, but just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. 
it, it's I'm just saying it's not bad to ask for more when you deserve it. And I, I want to um, bring up something that was said in the chat um, by Tiz Singh um, is the saying, fake it till you make it egotistic. I, I actually think it is. And I, it's funny she, uh, he or she brings that up because um, I, I teach in my product management boot camp, don't fake it till you make it. Instead, learn it till you earn it. And my boot camp is about learn it till you earn it. Like learn the skills that you need to be successful. No, no puedo ayudar, mi amor. Papi está en reunión. Lo siento. Te amo, Prentesa. No puedo, no puedo. Um, so um, so uh, that said, okay, I'm going to need to step away for another like three minutes. Um, Mike, well, let me see if, Michael, are you back? I'm here. All right, can you uh, handle, uh, Domin Dominic will go next and I'll, I'll be back when I can. Okay. Hello, yeah. Wow, there's a lot of topics. Uh, sorry, the angles on the table for the given topic. I um, maybe quick uh, thank you to the report about how it is uh, in the military world. I have zero ideas about the military, so that was really interesting to hear. Um, also, in terms of what characters maybe come up, or you know, that was super interesting. Um, I would dare say so. I, I first of all, for we saw in the presentation. I think in terms of um, having a um, sort of something operational and functional to work from, a certain model to work from, you know, um, self-confident people are maybe like this and egotism is that. I think that was super useful. I would say there's a lot in the presentation where I say, yeah, I mean, okay, that's something, you know, uh, uh, that can be applied and probably can really aid in decision-making. And obviously, uh, you also had to surely simplify things in your presentation. So, you know, I will not nitpick on on, on details. Um, so that makes perfect sense. And I think that works. I, I just will will um, add that it's my impression that um, one could fall into the trap to create these sort of hardcore categories, right? To say, well, when I, when I have a list of... Um, certain properties and I find them in a person, then I know this person is that. And um, especially I think in probably business and business psychology, uh, I, I, I dare say, and then I, I'm happy to stand corrected if someone knows otherwise, but I would say the, the goal is to create good and functional employees to reach the company's goal, right? So, this kind of thinking, this kind of um, approach that was presented, um, I would say um, it, it has a little bit of this box ticking character, let's say for hiring purposes, to create to identify individuals that can function well to run a business, right? So, um, and that's what I think is maybe a bit uh, problematic. It is, um, it is um, a, a kind of hard, harsh categorization that's happening. And th for this, Meyer Briggs uh, is also being criticized a lot. As far as I know, and again, happy to check other resources, but they are based on Jungian uh, ideas, Meyer Briggs, but Jung would have absolutely not agreed to the way how Maya breaks is used. Because this kind of first, it's as, as far as I know, it's completely self-assessed. And second, people end up saying, okay, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, full stop. Whereas Young would have been all about development, step into your shadow. You have all these multiple, you know, um, energies within you that are comp like competing forces that in a sort of emergent way or something, you know, bring up a character and so on. All this gets cut off and lost in, in, in Maya in my Briggs approaches or a business oriented kind of approaches that I sense in the, that was encoded in, in your presentation. So again, I, I don't want to smash it down. I think again, but I, it's all I'm saying is it's a very useful functional approach to divide the world, you know, in these hardcore categories, but I don't think it's reflecting the reality of human psychology. So, so yeah, just to be clear, Dominic, um, I didn't intend to mention Myers-Briggs in any way, shape or form. I don't think I used it in any way, shape or form in my definitions. 
And I do want you to nitpick. Um, you know, I don't have a lot more detail behind the presentation than what I shared, to be honest. So I welcome nitpicking. Um, I do agree with you that it was a very uh, black and white approach where I said, here's the egotist, here's the self-confident person. And I was doing that very intentionally because I think there's a lot of confusion between what is egotism versus what is self-confidence. And I wanted to create a clear delineation between the two, but I definitely agree with you. It's more nuanced. I agree with Derek, it's more nuanced. And when you're looking at an individual human being, you need to look at that individual human being and the skill set that you're assessing them for and are they self-confident or egotistical in that skill set and maybe they're not in another skill set or maybe they are the other in another skill set and it it is complicated and messy and nuanced and i definitely did make it seem much simpler to read and black and white but that's one of my goals right as i'm trying to take a very complex and nuanced subject and make it easier to understand and easier to distinguish between self-confidence and egotism so that you can recognize when someone is one or the other in clear and simple terms. That doesn't mean that someone will always fit into all of the categories of one or the other. I'm not trying to claim that they will. Um, does that make sense, Dominic? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, as someone who also sometimes has to hold presentations and, you know, this is quick and informative and, you know, and you're making a particular point. So that that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to help people distinguish between how to recognize self-confidence versus egotism, because I feel like it's so often that, you know, egotists are seen as self-confident. And so often that people who are actually self-confident are seen as egotists. And, you know, someone mentioned that tonight. It's happened to me too, where someone says, hey, Garrett, you're an egotist. And I'm like, mm, so help me understand that. Like, why do you think that? And then when you really understand where they're coming from, it it is often, and it, you know, it depends on the person in the situation. And, you know, you have to really dig into each person's perspective to understand it. But, you know, it's often that that's what they're used to seeing rather than um, an accurate reflection. But because of that, a lot of self-confident people have to feign lack of confidence and not accurately assess their skills because if they accurately assess their skills as you know being very good they are seen as an egotist you know misdiagnosed as an egotist for accurately assessing their skills a self-confident person should be able to say look i'm really good at this this is one of my strengths right like i i specialized in artificial intelligence in college and i you know did artificial intelligence algorithms i've done them since college i got a's in my algorithms in college and i've done them professionally for a long time so i would say i'm pretty good at artificial intelligence algorithms right so but, just to close with sorry to yeah. everybody else i know there's a cue but so to, to build yeah. on what you just said so would you agree that if i call a person um either self-confident or egotistic that these are op their opinions and yeah. they're not truth claims they're right. not you know, they're just well, they, they might be truth claims for you, but they're your they're your subjective truths. And until they're validated by objective reality, they're only oh. your subjective truths. And you have to decide whether or not to place your faith in the self-confident person that you see as self-confident. And over time, you'll see if you're trusting the people that you see as self-confident and you find they can always deliver on the things that they say they're good at, then your your assessment of who's self-confident is good. If you find you're trusting people who regularly fail to deliver, then you may be trusting egotists rather than self-confident people. Thanks. Does that make sense, Dominic? Yeah, yeah, good conversation. Yeah, good to reflect on these things. Yeah, thanks for insights. Yeah, no problem. So, Shonik. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of conversation and I believe consensus on the need to be Dif differentiate between self-confident people and uh, egotistical people. My question is, you know, I sometimes wonder why is there on, on the on the other level, it's just like why is there this tendency among humans to, you know, take people or consider people at a very very high level who might be egotistical or even. Uh, let's say let's say self-confident my point is you know it's it's uh, it, this tendency that we see quite often in public that you know 
this uh, proliferation of fake gurus or uh, even in religious uh, environments. It's like having, putting so much faith in one person and not having the capability or insistence on being suspicious, uh, you know, it, it, it's just like a, it just feels like, you know, given the proliferation of these fake gurus, it's just like, why does there need to be a messianic uh, individual that you need to, you know, put complete faith in? And this is what happens with, you know, you, you, you see like these egotistical people and their followers would be like completely trusting of them. It seems a bit odd. It's I, this is, and I'm just wondering what people think of why this tendency actually exists among humans. This need to completely give up yourself. So I think Michael had a hand up or something, but I'm just wondering what other people think. It's more of a question about human nature. Michael, did you want to start on that? I can go after. Well, I would say it seems like we're. Um, discussing this from the perspective that everybody has an equal ability to detect a nurse, uh, um, an egotist and someone who's self-confident. But I know from personal experience when I was <laughs> secure that I am now, the egotists could really overwhelm me and make me think they were much more capable than they were because because I was insecure, I was so impressed with their sense of security, their sense of ability, their sense of um, agency. So I think the perceiver has a lot to do with being able to um, differentiate between egotism and self-confidence. Yeah, and in fact, I think it would be fascinating, and I'm going to take this as an after exercise to think about what attracts people to egotism. I think what Michael said is someone who isn't self-confident can be attracted to the high self-confidence that someone is exhibiting without being able to detect that they don't actually deserve that high self-confidence. They just see the, the really extreme self-confidence and they go, wow, I wish I had that. And so I want to be like that person. And then there are other situations, I won't go into details, but I will say sometimes self-confident like uh egotists will tell people you know um what how do i say sweet lies that make them feel good and um people just want to be told it'll all be okay and this person will make it all better and even though it's not it doesn't have any basis in reality they want to be told sweet lies and an egotistical person who seems so very self-confident, like I'll make all your problems go away. Just trust me. Right. Mm -hmm. It feels like, well, if I'm very nervous and worried and afraid or, you know, um, have a lot of anger and pain and this person is promising me, they'll make it all go away. Sometimes a person will prefer the sweet lie to the, the actual tough reality. Um, and honestly, I say that as someone who I, I think I try to look at the tough reality every time. And I think in general, the the actual truth is a much more fair, just and um, compassionate reality in the long term. Um, but I do think that's another thing that attracts people to egotists. Well, I suspect there's probably very good evolutionary reasons that may be outdated uh, for modern society, why people are attracted to egotists. And I think part of that definitely has to do with how most people do have a innate fear of uncertainty, right? And what do egotists do? They tell a story, they tell a narrative, and all of a sudden, you know, there's something to believe in. And I think there's many psychological studies that shows how, you know, people really, you know, have, you know, like uncertainty literally paints them, right? And there's like decision paralysis and so on and so forth. So imagine, I would imagine probably at least in the, when people are roaming in the caves and grassland, if you were to err on the side of being more egotistical than neutral versus being under, uh, you know, confident or under egotistical, it probably has some survival benefits to be more egotistical. That, that's my suspicion, right? For, yeah. for various reasons. Yeah. And, and I would also say that in, in some sense, maybe 
on a broader level, it kind of works out because the thing with egotists is that they make bold claims. So in terms of actually getting filtered out by, okay, are they egotists or are, do they talk big, but also back it up versus do they talk big and they have, you know, nothing substantial to show for it, right? The thing with egotists, if they talk big, probably, you know, in a, in a grassland, they're going to get killed if they don't have the ability to back it up. So it could have very well be like evolutionary, um, your heuristic we developed to basically <laughs> to go with that proxy, right? Because, you know, the thing with egotists is that, okay, if they're not the real deal, they're going to be killed off pretty quickly by yeah. being so, such a blabbermouth. Yeah. I love that. I mean, that's yeah. philosophical about it. Yeah. Uh, as always, Charles, really good insight. I think that's actually right on the point. Like, I think that's on the money. The, the egotist, you know, evolutionarily, the egotist that thinks they can do it but can't is going to get killed by the rhinoceros. And so, you know, hey, there's no more egotists left. Now we're going to go to the new leader who's <laughs> acting self-confident. Uh, something no the, he's uh, capable the, of killing the next rhinoceros. There's something called the Darwin Awards every year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it also makes me feel, you know, that, that discussion, uh, I believe, Charles, that was you, uh, uh, you know, it, this connection, uh, how much is this actually related to, you know, the proliferation of religions? Uh, if you see the tenets of some religion, and I really want to be very sensitive here, it's, it's uh, I don't want to make, but, you know, you listen to the axioms or, or the uh, facts of some religions, they claim things. I'm not saying I'm not, you know, they're true or not. You believe whatever you want to believe. But uh, in the end, it's, it's just like giving up your faith to that degree. It, 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 there's an evolutionary re reasons for uh, religion also. And if you see founders of religion, you know, they have strong claims. Uh, I'm, not say, I'm not going to make a comment whether the, what the founder said is right or wrong, but there, there is a level of attraction there which is very very uh you know you, you want to believe uh um uh, anyway that's all thanks shanik um i don't there think was... buddha had like i mean different religions have different origin stories but the buddha didn't have much of a metaphysical um claim um and so um yeah i, I would argue that one doesn't have so many um you know hard to believe stories, although I believe that some of the hard to believe stories may well have been true. Um, there's a lot more to this world than meets the surface. Um, as we learned in our uh, uh, event on reincarnation, where I was shocked to hear that there's actually scientific research that shows that reincarnation most likely is true. Um, that said, um, I wanna let Phil go. He has had his hand up for quite a time. Yeah, it seems to me like in any situation, one has to actually be at ease. I mean, that really shows a kind of confidence. And not only at ease, but a, a, a certain lack of care. You care for certain things, but certain other things you don't care about. And what happened is, in, in such a conversation, particularly when you're talking about a job, is that, you know, you want to express yourself authentically and uh, let them make the decision. If they think you're not good enough, that's fine. You know, if they think you're good enough, that's good. I mean, I, I myself have never asked for a raise. Uh, so I'm different in that sense. Because, you know, if they don't want you for whatever reason, uh, it's easier to leave. And even if they don't want you for the wrong reason, I wouldn't want to be there for somebody who uh, didn't like me because I was maybe too good for this situation. So everything is fine. And I think when you're at ease, then in a sense, uh, you could take things in stride and just be very, be very comfortable when you do. Now, you have to have some skills about what it is you're, you're doing, and you also have to have some skills to be able to talk. And that, that's what puts you at ease because quite often tricky questions are asked, this and that. You have to be able to maneuver through that kind of like a surf through the waves. And I think what happened is at the end, uh, th that's the case. There was a case when I, uh, uh, back when I was uh, you know, teaching, 
I was looking for a job, and I got an interview at the University of Dallas at Texas. And uh, there was a woman who was in the search committee who, uh, for whatever reason, didn't didn't like what I did or what I did. But there was other committee members, and she was relentlessly asking questions. And finally, it got sort of seemed like a little personal. And I said, well, if we're going to get personal, then you need to put yourself on the table as well, and then we could have a fair discussion. You know? So finally, it just went on and on. I finally said, you know, like, well, if you think that you know what you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, you don't. And uh, if that's the way it is, the uh, the interview is over. <laughs> I said <laughs> that to her. I, the interview is over. And I think what happened, here's a surprising thing that happened. I did not get the job, but next year, the dean called me up and said, we would like you to apply for this job again. And I said to the dean, like, well, why would I apply for a job that I've been rejected for already? And he says, you don't understand. The committee did not come to a decision, and they wanted to invite you to be another interview. Unfortunately, I had another job already, so I didn't do that. I have a feeling that other members of the committee really objected to this woman who was questioning me, and they knew I was right. And so there was a kind of a standoff, you know, and uh, and I was invited. I mean, it's like I was, I was so surprised, you know, like, so th there's something that, in a sense, the interviewer, in some sense, could show themselves to be wrong in certain ways, that you're at ease with the situation. So, yeah. you know, and you're at ease with saying, okay, the interview's over, I'm leaving. You know, I mean, it's like, that's fine. If, if you can't do that, then the desperation in you being, wanting to be there will show up that somehow maybe you can't quite handle it. You know, yeah, that's the way it goes. I just want to say I wish I had the courage like Phil here, you know. So it sounds like it uh, takes a lot of balls to do that, you know. Sounds sounds like a movie scene. So to be honest, well, not well, not only that, but you know, that was a situation where I actually wanted a job. You know, it was it wasn't like oh, well, I already had a job. What's the big deal? I'm I'm going back to what was. Uh, but you have to be the walk away, and you have to have, in a sense, enough reserve, and and believing in yourself that somehow you'll get by. If you don't believe in yourself, then of course, then it's nervous time. You know, you have, you're desperate for this situation and you should never put yourself in that position. That's right. it, Phil. And, and Phil, I think that's a great sort of signal to the other people that you were interviewing with that you were self-confident because you were so confident in your accurate assessment of the situation that you were willing to walk away from a job because you would rather walk away from a job rather than, you know, be dishonest about what you knew to be true. Does that sound right? Yeah, I I think the other uh, the other committee members they they saw it, and she exactly. was the main you know advocate against me, and the other people yeah. were somewhat silent, but they sort of agree with me to the degree they did. It. Yeah, I had a somewhat similar situation just to give people hope that being honest actually does pay off. You know, I was interviewing for a major, like probably Fortune 50 company. And, um, you know, like they asked me how the interviews went. And I said, look, I, I'm going to withdraw because I just didn't feel like I could work for the hiring manager that was interviewing me. I really like the company. I like the culture. But, you know, I didn't feel confident that I would be successful with that hiring manager. And she was super egotistical. I sensed that right from the interview, um, you know, just super egotistical and didn't really know what she was talking about very well. And so, you know, they tried to get me to interview with them again a number of times, but I ended up starting my own company. And even though they pay really well, I, I think I'll do better on my own uh, in the long run. So, but the fact that they reached out to me again, even after I said, I didn't want to work for that hiring manager that you were going to put me under, you know, says that, you know, some of the other people I interviewed with must have, you know, sense that you know th there's like you know had good feedback or something like that and i think people can 
sense that if you're willing to walk away, and I say that as an additional to, you know, nudge to Shawnick to be honest with, you know, don't be brutal, you know, be polite about it. But um, to be able to be honest about, you know, hey, look, I don't think this is a fit. Like you have to be able to walk away from something that's a bad situation. I've worked for hiring managers that I should never have worked for in the first place. And that's not fun. Um, and so well, the, you want to pick and well, choose carefully who you work for. Well, there's also a secondary effect. You know, as I said, you know, you have to be able to uh, be at ease and yep. take things in stride. Okay. And I think in that conversation, I was always at ease. Yeah. You know, go wherever you want to go and, and and skate around the situation. And I think that's how you could detect the other who is inauthentic because they're trying a bit too hard. <laughs> and you could tell that they're a bit uptight. So if you want to look for a leader, as a leader who somehow have the confidence always to be at ease and take things in stride. You know, that's it. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Michael, you want to go next? Oh, I said what I wanted to say. <clears throat> Let me take my hand down. I apologize. Okay. Then um, I welcome other comments or, yeah, Derek, go ahead. Yeah. Was, With yours. The organizations are run by egotists. Um, <laughs> There's kind of a there's another question I, I put it in the chat earlier, but it's probably lost by now. And the question is, uh, you get some ego, egotistical alpha running the organization. How many people uh, would rather be right and remain silent, or be unpopular by disagreeing with the uh, something the, um, the egotist is saying there's been a lot of psychology this is almost a subject for for another another uh, meeting another time but it's uh would you rather be right or would you rather be popular true right. because that 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 explains the success i think of uh, a lot of mass movements people mm -hmm. are afraid at some point they read they 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 don't not only don't want to become unpopular by expressing what they think is right, but they want to stay alive. Yeah, I guess. And there's been some psych a lot of serious psychology. I I don't have the paper code here. I I made a note the other day, but I can't lay my hands on it right now. Uh, but a, an interesting experiment where people were were uh, asked to indicate you know which which of these four lines a b c or d is the longest and they'd indicate it but they would then expose them in a group and uh by by the end of the discussion a lot of them were convinced that this other line was the longest even though objectively it wasn't but they were they just wanted to fit in so they did it there's a lot of controlled psychology experiments done on this. So it's, it's yeah, the more serious questions. It's uh, it seems common that people will go along or remain silent on something, either to survive, keep their jobs, or whatever. That would be uh, peer pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And the what the study did is there were like seven lines and there were seven people and the seven lines were not all the same length and the right. first six people all said the lines are all the same length even though the seventh one clearly wasn't and yeah. the first six people all said they're all the same length but they were all part of the study and the seventh person would almost inevitably say the lines are all the same length because they didn't want to disagree with the first six people they would seem like the only one that you know in a peer group that was saying something different and very few people will stand up and speak out against the authority or the even the consensus of peers. And so I think it's a great point. And that's, you know, that's why, you know, we talked about this in another event where basically in my company, what I do is I'll make an assertion and I'll say, I think this should be this color of blue. Who disagrees with me? And I'll always ask for who disagrees with me first, because I don't want three people to agree with me. And then the one person who says, 
Garrett, that shade of blue has this emotional impact and it's going to be horrible for the company. And, you know, I want that person to speak up first because then we get a diversity of opinion and then we hear everybody's perspective and we hear the pros and the cons and we get into a more nuanced conversation. As long as one person disagrees, there should be a new, more nuanced conversation. And I don't think all all company leaders are egotistical. There was a guy, um, uh, I forget what it was, like Galaxy Payments or something like that, that like paid even like his admin $70,000 USD a year. Um, and, you know, he was like trying to be very egalitarian and, and, um, I try to be the same, uh, for my company. You can ask people that work for plate rate, whether or not I am or not, um, you'll find them on LinkedIn and, um, and, you know, hmm. but I do think that it takes us a, a high degree of self-confidence, whether it's real or fake to start your own company. And some people fake it till they make it and they're egotistical and they don't really have the the skills to back up the self-confidence and then other people are self-confident and I guess the the market probably rewards the self-confident ones in the long run I think and so we'll see that said um uh if anyone wants to comment on Derek's comment um feel free yeah go ahead Carl uh yeah um Gee, now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. Let me let me put a quick interjection, and I'll try to give you a a bio. Oh, of I, time. Oh, no, this ahead. is what I want to share. Actually, uh, from what you said, Garrett, um, I I used to live in a co housing community for one year, uh, where you would think that they would make decisions uh, democratically. Right. But <laughs> they're, they're, no, but I, you're going to be surprised what I'm going to say. Actually, um. They they actually uh, they would they would discuss whatever some proposal that somebody wanted to make, and if one person actually was against it, they would they would they would stop. They would not vote on it until and then members were were uh, free to go talk to the person to try to change their mind. But even if there was one dissenter, they would not. It's like almost like the in the jury system about the unanimous. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. A decision had to be unanimously voted on for any decision, which was yeah. really interesting. That's yeah. cool. Um, you know, I think that I I think like that's good. Um, but I was going to give the opposite example when you gave that, which is um, you know, I've joined some of my condo and uh, co-op board meetings, and generally they they'll have like. 10 people in a community of like 2000 show up and those 10 people make all the decisions. They don't want to get feedback from the community. And I was like, why don't we get feedback from the community? Why don't we do surveys? Why don't we do this? I got, you know, nasty looks from the people on the board who were like, we're the decision makers. We're the ones that show up. We get to make all the decisions for the community. And I'm like, Oh boy, like, you know, I, um, if I had more time to run for the board, I probably would um but yeah it's uh it's nice to hear someone doing it the other way around to be honest um to have veto effect so uh, i think shaunik uh raised his party hat so go ahead shaunik oh, i had a comment on that that is the ideal way to do it you know a truly democratic let's say way uh and which would satisfy but you know it, attempts like that on a larger scale do not seem to bring about quick progress and i want to make distinction of quick. So, you know, you, you just look at the political system of India and China. India being so diverse, you know, in its parliamentary system, even if it had it's it has a lot of problems, but you know, at least it has democratic in the sense that, you know, it has to go through a lot of uh, these markers that it has to satisfy. China, on the other hand, even though uh, uh, even uh, though it has its records of human rights violations and whatnot, given that it's a one-party state and decisions are made quickly, relatively speaking, you know, it, it's one of the major reasons why China was able to grow as quickly as it did. I sometimes, you know, try to, you know, wonder which is a better system, you know, taking into consideration all sides on a deontic perspective you know you wouldn't say china's policies are uh, can be justified but on a utilitarian way you know it does uh, 
but that's something that is uh, important to consider as well. If, if somebody at the end, sometimes, you know, uh, there's always going to be some dissent on any particular choice. And if you're waiting for everybody to come to consensus, and this uh, happens in companies, it's just like, every, see many of the recent very, very big corporations that have gone big, uh, <laughs> their CEOs and their leaders, they have had to be brutal. Um, so I, I, I'm not making a value judgment of what is right or wrong. I'm just saying there's a pattern to it. Yeah. No, you're right. In all fairness, too, it was a small community. And, and I agree with you, Shanak, that, that if it was a large uh, country, probably would it would be a standstill for sure. But, you know, democracy, I mean, democracy means, as far as I know, that there's more like the majority wins, but that means there's always a minority that that is uh, unhappy. Um, and I, I remember hearing once a anecdote that said, um, you know, uh, three wolves and two sheep, uh, even democratically, uh, the sheep are going to be eaten, right? Uh, three to two. So um, it's not, democracy is not always fair. Yeah, yeah. I, I would only say, Shonik, that I don't think that India's problem is solely that it's a democracy. It's the corruption. If you got rid of the corruption in India, yeah, 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 it's a lot. You got rid of the corruption in India. It's a much better scenario than what you have in China, where China has a surveillance state. You know, they have, you know, government re like they're literally like saying what people are allowed to wear now on the streets. And if you wear the wrong things, you get in trouble with the police and for wear wearing the wrong clothing. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty tough in China right now. So, um, I mean, if I said this in China, wait, on... are you talking about China or Iran? China. Iran also. Iran has the same issue with the woman. What's that? In Iran, women have to be dressed according to the law. If right. Are... Yeah, because the U.S. the U.S. got rid of the democratically elected government of Iran, and so now there's a fundamentalist government that replaced the one that was loyal there's to the election. CIA. There's election in Iran. Well, it's... there might be theoretical elections, but is there a practical election? What's the difference? The difference is one: your vote actually matters, and in the other, it doesn't. But let's let uh, well, we'll step away from his screen. But the, there are there are technically elections in Russia too. But what Putin does is anyone that might be a threat to him in the elections, he either kills or jails. So it's not a real election; it's a fake election. That's not a real election. That's not a democracy. So, um, so I think I, I think once ahead, we Jeff. are talking about um, like instead talking about things at an institutional level and even societal level, then the picture becomes quite complex. And then it becomes a much harder question to answer. Uh, to the like the corporate example, I, I don't know if the earlier speaker was talking about IBM, but IBM is actually one of the prominent examples where this process actually failed, precisely because the, their process was too bureaucratic. In order to make any changes, they had to go through like 20 different managers and anyone can veto it. And essentially it has become pretty much a textbook example of how having you know too much, uh, I suppose, decentralized decision making actually kind of hurt a company. But I suppose it also kind of depends on what stage the company is at, right? It generally, when it comes to probably smaller companies, startups. Well, I mean, I guess that differs too, right? Some startups you really need somebody with a vision, and it's not run like a democracy. Whereas, okay, if it's a stable organization, then it could be something different. You know, same thing when it comes to society. It's like it's like what part of society do you want it to be democratic, right? So for example, military, there is democracy at some levels, but at some levels, it's definitely not. It's a strict chain of command. Uh, and even when it comes to kind of comparing countries, it does get difficult, right? Because like, which China are we talking about? Uh, those who kind of really study China, it's like there's been probably three iterations of different versions of China, even though it's all nominally, you know, run by the CCP, right? There was the Maoist, there was the kind of reformed opening, and currently, unfortunately, we have a, you know, a, a retrenchment with the current uh, uh, guy named Xi, right? And I, su I suspect even for India, right, there's different up, variations, yeah, different variations of uh, kind of what kind of policy they pursue. Uh, but uh, to to the very early original uh, speaker's point, I think on individual level, you kind of have to pick your battles, right? So I'll give the example of witches. 
right? It, it was much better for you. Chelsea, we're, we're survival, almost, right? We're almost oh, done sorry. with the event, and we have two hands up. We let Will okay, go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'll, I'll stop. Okay. Will, go ahead. Thank you. Wow, the party hat dimension has taken a new turn, it seems. Um, I, I, which is, I don't know, I'm open to debate whether that's a good thing or not. I've found uh, in management that um, egotists are everywhere. We've all got an ego, that's for sure, and we need to acknowledge that. But when you've got somebody that's egocentric to the point of narcissism, you don't want them on a management team generally because they can be detrimental to the greater good, I've found. And if you have them above you in the management hierarchy, uh, you need to figure out how to work with them if you're concerned with the greater good and uh, of the of the whole of the whole establishment if if you're working for the greater good of the of the whole enterprise and you have a narcissist they can make things very difficult if they're in a position of power a narcissist or an egotist and you need to work learn to work with them and they can be fairly easily manipulated if for instance you ask them for advice. So you figure out what the th the problem is that needs to be addressed. And you know that they're going to be the they're going to be the hurdle in getting this thing passed, this sort of action um, acted upon. So you need to get them on board. And to do that, you ask them for their advice and you point out what the problem is. But the first thing you say is, I would like your advice on this. Um, and they have can be very easily manipulated because you just got to stroke their stroke their ego because ultimately it's all about them and unfortunately they often rise to the positions of power um because it's a it's a massive ego trip for an egotist and then they get the position of power and they just want to keep it at the detriment of all others and this is the same in politics and all across the business world it's the egotists quite often are running the show everywhere and they need to be called out as well for if you're concerned about the greater good but it's good to understand the psychology of it, that we've all got an ego, but some people just thrive off it. And they can often be extremely um, high achievers as well. Like they can be very talented people in their own right. But then somehow the ego gets in and uh, and it can become uh, become negative. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Will. And I agree with you on a lot of fronts. Um I would say um, to to satisfy the egotists uh, ego, you you have to be dishonest, and that's where like I draw the line. I'm not willing to lie to them to sort of sa satiate their well, uh, their uh, desire. Yeah, I'm not talking about lying with them. I mean, I was in a health and safety committee on a pa on a um, passenger vessel, and there were some very important life and death decisions had to be made in regards to health and safety. And even with that, they just put obstructions there. They didn't. They wouldn't acknowledge the dangers that were present for the general public even. And in order to get them on board, you had to ask, you had to lie to them, not really lie, but just just ask for their advice. So the only lying was that your motives may not have been as uh, sort of conducive to their worldview as, as <laughs> they thought. That was the, That was the only lie. You weren't blatantly lying. You're just stroking their ego for the. Group. I don't have time to get into it in more detail, but um, you know, I I um I would love to pick your brain on that in the online community to better understand what you did without lying and still able to satisfy their ego. But um, didn't have to lie at all. Didn't have to lie once. Yeah. So teach me how it's done. Well, um. So, but in the online community, because we gotta we gotta finish up, and I want to let um Chris go. So go ahead, Chris. Hi, good evening. I joined in late and already I have uh, several comments to make. Um, yes. I, I will keep them compact. Uh, the first one, uh, there was a mention, Garrett, about the six people, you know, agreeing that the, all the lines were even and, and all that. Um, I don't know if any of you have come across um, online. There was a an experiment where it was a waiting room and everyone in the one person started standing up just spontaneously and, and the other people started standing up and then sitting down and, and it was the most comical thing to watch. It, it was hard to believe that was real. Yeah. But the, the sheeple effect. Yeah. Um, the, um, about the condo uh, 
board. Uh, I'm going to make a comment to say, you know, to some extent, you know, depending on the magnitude of the decision, you know, whether it has far reaching implications financially or for a long time, um, you know, the magnitude of the decision, uh, the, the bigger ones, I would say, you know, it would make sense to get input. Uh, whereas the other ones, you could say, hey, we got to run through these and just, you know, move things along. Um, and, and there needs to be some discussion about the magnitude factor, you know, to understand when, when to, you know, get the input. Um, uh, the third thing, which is interesting to me is in terms of uh, some people mentioned about corporations and stuff. Um, if, if there's a situation where you bring up an idea and you can only really bring it up with your immediate boss and they don't buy into the idea, then a lot of times the idea doesn't have a chance to go any further and you might have to take a risk of going around them or above them to try to promote the idea, whatever it is. And that's very unfortunate. I see uh, David is reacting and um, maybe you've seen that happen, right? Yeah. I've definitely and, seen and, that happen, Chris. Yeah. Um, and the last thing is there's an incredible book and I would encourage all of you to take a look at this book by uh, Amanda Ripley. The title, the short title is The Unthinkable. She has also written some other books, but in particular, The Unthinkable is about who survives in situations. And she gives a whole bunch of examples about the thinking process of how things happen. And in particular, there was, um, I think it was in the Catskills, there was a fire that was breaking out in the kitchen and uh, an employee told the, his manager, you know, there's a fire in the kitchen. You know, we have to get, ha the people have to get out of the entertainment room. And the manager just kind of like, uh, just, you know, didn't really even react. And um, eventually as the story goes, um, that young employee went up to the microphone where there was like a comedian on the stage. And he said, there's a fire in the kitchen. We all have to get out of this room. And the fascinating thing on it is that it crossed his mind that he might get fired for taking that step. But the social situation is that he had just joined working there pretty recently and he wasn't all socially connected to be concerned about. He was a little bit thinking he might get fired, but he wasn't concerned about what, you know, other people were going to think about him and that's so incredible to, yeah. to think about that factor there and she has several other examples of how the dynamics worked and i would just encourage all of you to look at that book thank you for the recommendation chris and for the great comments and i agree with you that not all decisions should be made by all you know shareholders in an organization um it, it does depend on the severity but you know, when you're talking about whether or not to put in uh, uh, speed bumps, that affects everyone in the community. And I would think that you would want to let people know that there are going to be speed bumps coming in. But no, they didn't do that. They just put them in. And, um, you know, and so, um, yeah, I guess it depends on the, the situation. Um, and thank you for the, the book recommendation. Again, um, I'm going to look it up on uh, ChatGPT since I don't have time to read the whole book but um, I'll look for the essence of it in ChatGPT, um, which by the way, did come up with um, the experiment that we were talking about is the, the ASH uniformity exper uh, conformity experiments um, from the 1950s. Um, so that's the one about the lines. And uh, I think it was Carl got it right that it was four lines. I thought it was seven, but I remembered wrong. So <laughs> there's my, <laughs> my bad memory. Carl, did you have something you wanted to finish with? We're going uh, to kind of close out. Just quickly to Chris, because what you mentioned about uh, the um, the social experiment thing reminded me of Candid Camera. If anybody has ever seen the show Candid Camera. <laughs> yes. uh -huh. in, the, yeah. in the 50s, the old, the old one actually um, had a very famous experiment where people stand in an elevator 
and everybody everybody's in on the on the joke in a sense and when somebody goes into the elevator you always face the door and suddenly yeah. they start facing the other way and you can see the the, the, the person's reaction and then yeah. eventually they turn and then they turn again then they turn again <laughs> yeah so yeah, we're I mean, uh, evolutionarily speaking, we I mean, we're social animals, and 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 being part of a group was a survival thing. If you, if you're an objective yeah. objective group, you, you it was death. So we definitely we have the sense of conformity for sure. Uh, and then also, uh, I was reminded too of uh, if anybody's seen the movie Aliens, the second one, the military leader who was kind of like he was the leader, but he was clearly not up to his element there. Uh, I don't know if you remember that character. It was a, it was a, a clear example of somebody who just like either faked it or just were not uh, didn't have the skills uh, to deal with it. With whatever it. the situation was, yeah. Great. Well, thank yeah. you for sharing. I'm going to close out here. Thank you all for coming. Um, great having you all. And um, you know, I did put the link to next week's event. I'll put it in again real quick. If you want to um, come to next week's event, it'll be on uh, same life and post life karma. I'm going to try to make an argument. Both of them are real. Um, and relevant. Um, and even if you don't agree on post-life, I think you'll at least agree with same life. And um, uh, after that, we're going to have a conversation on globalism. What is it? And is it good or bad? And after that, we'll have the Freethinker Institute Practical Guide to Stoicism. So I've kind of taken the Stoic values and added my own little spin to it. And I'm going to try to have a graphic in place That'll be like a memorable meme that you can use to use the practical guide to stoicism um, as a, a guide in one's life. Um, so, uh, Michael, did you have something else you wanted to say? I just want to say that I put in chat, I put the website um, for the Freethinker Institute. If you enjoyed this, you'll enjoy the Freethinker Institute. And I um, urge you to click on the link and take a look. Thanks, Michael. And Michael and Charles are both members of the FTI. And um, and so, yeah, we would love to welcome other people into the, the fold. And uh, we welcome everyone coming back to next week's event. Uh, no, Addy, it's FTI, like uh, Free Thinker Institute, FTI, uh, not FBI. Um, so <laughs> the FBI are the ones that spy on us um, and now legally spy on us. So, um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so... Um, so uh, I also put the event for next week's event, if uh, the link for next week's event, if people want to click on that and join us for a discussion on karma. So I um, hope everyone has a great rest of your night. And uh, thanks. Thanks for coming. Carl, did you have a last thing you wanted to say? Uh, uh, Garrett, I was just going to ask you about the reincarnation thing. Do you remember? Is that on YouTube on the recorded? It will be up. If it's not up yet, it will be up you know, within the next month or so, um, we're putting up all the historical ones. Um, I just finally decided to pay someone to do the historical video editing. So we're uh, uploading our historical ones now uh, in pretty fast form. So it'll be up there. There's not a ton about because I didn't know about the scientific research on um, reincarnation, I don't believe until the event happened. So it was during the event that I did a quick Google of it. And I was like, what, this is already studied. I basically was making an a priori argument that reincarnation is true, but I didn't have scientific evidence of it. And someone's like, hey, Garrett, this has been studied. And so I Googled it and then I looked it up after the fact. And there's article after article about how there are studies. There's even a meta study on um, reincarnation. Um, so, yeah, it's fascinating. I always used to tell people, I hope I make enough money that I can study whether or not reincarnation is real by like looking at these stories of children that talk about past life experiences and seeing whether this is valid or whether this is made up well it turns out people have done it so yeah already done i have other things i can do <laughs> so thanks a lot everyone have a great night have a good night everyone bye-bye